A mom left alone on Mother's Day didn't respond to texts or calls from her daughters or husband. Hours later, there were still no signs of her as friends, family, and local law enforcement spread out and searched the roads and mountainous terrains of Chafee County, Colorado. Then, her blue mountain bike was found down a ravine not far from their home. What had happened to Suzanne Morphew? Before we begin, we would like to extend our deepest sympathies to the family and friends of Suzanne Morphew. We would like to remind our viewers that at the time of this video, the case remains unsolved and no one has been proven guilty in a court of law. We will present the facts of the case and let them speak for themselves. In the early morning hours of Sunday morning, May the 10th, 2020, Barry Morphew, a landscaping contractor, rolled out of bed at 4.30 a.m., showered, got dressed, and was in his truck, headed to a job just outside of Denver, Colorado, by 5 a.m. He had left his wife, Suzanne, sleeping peacefully in their bed. The night before had been a good night for the couple. They shared steaks cooked on the grill, lovemaking, and an early bedtime, according to statements made by Barry. The couple's daughters were away on a road trip through Nevada and Utah, and the couple had made the most of their time together. It was cold and clear that morning as he climbed into the cab of his Ford F-350 truck. It was a chilly 24 degrees outside, and it would take until mid-afternoon for it to warm up into the 70s that day. Barry would drive about 125 miles to a Holiday Inn Express in Denver before checking in, taking a short rest, and then heading out to the job site in the nearby town of Broomfield, where his company was installing a retaining wall. He would come back to the hotel after making a few stops around town. That's when he got a text from his daughters asking if he had heard from their mom that day. His own texts hadn't been answered either, so he asked them to call the neighbors and have them check on Suzanne and the house. Perhaps she was just out riding her bike, as she often did. At about 5 p.m., Jean Ritter, the neighbor, called back to let them know that Suzanne was not at home, but her Range Rover was still in the garage. Her mountain bike was missing, along with her bicycling helmet. Barry advised them to call the local police to see if they could find her while he drove back from Denver. He then let his co-workers know that he had a family emergency. He left some tools for them in the lobby of the hotel and headed home. One worker, Jeff Puckett, would be taking over the hotel room that Barry had been in, and another, Morgan Ann Gentiles, would be staying in another nearby room in the hotel. As Barry drove back home, members of the Chafee County Sheriff's Office began a concerted effort to find the missing woman. Suzanne was 49 years old and physically fit, although she had survived multiple bouts of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma cancer over the years. She had recently taken up mountain biking as a hobby and rode almost daily along the trails in the surrounding area, always transporting her Santa Cruz mountain bike in the back of her white Range Rover to the locations. Officers of the sheriff's office fanned out and began to search in earnest for the missing woman while it was still daylight. Beginning near the family's home, the patrol SUV slowly rolled down the road the officers within spotted down in a ravine, a blue bicycle upended and caught in the brush. This was a little over a mile from the family home. Deputy Damon Brown and Sergeant Lamaine Mullinax made their way down the slope and were able to make it to the bicycle. The state of the bicycle seemed curious to the two officers. Maybe see if you can get that up to the road and then pick the serial number or call the husband and see what kind of bike she has. Something's up with the front tire. Meanwhile, the two daughters, Mallory and Macy Morphew, along with a boyfriend, returned to the home. They entered the house but did not find Suzanne or any sign of her on the premises. When the deputies arrived, the boyfriend went out and spoke to them first, explaining the situation as best he could. Are you... Okay, so I'm the daughter's boyfriend. Okay. And I'm here to... Is this your truck? That's my truck. So you haven't seen the mom at all, have you? Yep, so the two daughters are gone right now at the uh -huh. moment. The dad is in Denver for a job, and they text her because of Mother's Day, and they haven't heard. The text never went through, like it never delivered since okay. this morning. 
and her, she's a big mountain biker. She normally takes her car, yeah. and her bike's normally in the back of that. It's gone. Her was this open here. when you came here? Um, the neighbor was here that opened it, and then she shut it, and she went back to her house. Her house is right over there. Okay. And then I came back, and I opened it to come in the house. Okay. Yeah. Have you looked in the house for I her? have, yep. All right. You've looked through everything? Yes. You haven't found her? No. He continues and then offers some insights into where she rode her mountain bike and, curiously, why she didn't take the bike on the nearby road, the road where the bicycle was found. Uh, what time did you get here? Six, six o'clock and then I went all the way up Fusis because uh -huh. she's ro rode up there. And I just drove the main road, couldn't find her, and then there's a couple spots that I could check, like trails and stuff. But I wanted to come back here to just like check back in and stuff. Okay. Yeah. If she has she ever gone up two twenty five? The Colorado Trail right like, there. Like you know the big hill once you come yeah. up the highway? Well, she hasn't and I haven't checked there yet because that climb at the beginning is really hard. Yeah. And I think that it would be out of characteristic for her to do that. But I I mean someone needs to go there, I think. Why would you say this? Like on care? Well, because it's kind of a crazy Okay. It's kind of a crazy climb to get up there. Right. It's like not really rideable. You gotta push your bike before you can start riding. One of the daughters then finds an Instagram photo of her mom in her bicycling gear to show the deputies. Just right out here on the road. Right out there, okay. Right where you found. Where, Wait, she she wear any jackets? She, yeah, she probably would have had. What kind of jackets does she wear? I mean, a windbreaker. A windbreaker? I don't know what color. I saw her. I mean, we don't even know what jacket. time she left today. Yeah. yeah. But they have cameras. They have cameras, but they've been out of commission for a while. A few minutes later, now down the road where the bicycle had been found, a deputy continues asking the boyfriend about Barry and Suzanne. The young man's father is now with them and advises him to speak freely. Um, I know this is a weird question, yeah. but um, do Barry and Suzanne get along pretty well? Uh... You can answer honestly. You know, I think I think they've had some problems. Okay. Yeah, in the past. Like, just normal. Normal husband and wife type deal. Oh, they and, like talk about separating or anything. They like have. That? Yeah. Okay. I would. Yeah. And you know this through. Through Macy. Yeah, I'm Macy. very close with uh, her. Yeah, her, it's, her it's important that you. At this I know. Point, I know. You I tell know. Them I know. Anything, yeah. you know. Just minutes later, as the sun went down and night fell across the area, Barry pulled up to the officers alongside the road where the bicycle had been found. She bikes every day, yeah. Okay. She's, she's gonna bike and she gets up. So she was asleep in the bed when you left? Did you say bye to her or anything? No, she's not asleep. Okay. So the last time you probably actually okay. saw her was this morning. That was it, right? Yeah. Did they A lot check of people the house? Did they, yeah. They got, you looked through the house? Yeah, they got the house, and so what we're doing is we're keeping people out of the house because if the dog comes, they want to get a scent from out of the house. Yeah. So they don't want to pollute that scent. So that way we can start trying. And I walked up this. I Like I said, I didn't see anything out of the ordinary. Nothing looked like... I wonder if she was hurt, if she could climb up the hill. But that's the thing. When we came here, still it was daylight, right? So if she was right here, somebody would have easily... You know what I mean? Just Because it was like literally like right now. It was this, I mean, if we saw it coming in... Somebody would have definitely seen it too, you know? The deputy, seeing differences in Barry's information and what they had gotten from her daughter's boyfriend earlier, they press him again. I know the bike was here, but what are some of the paths that, or like the trails? Like she rides this road, she rides up to, yeah. she rides up to the top and then she goes up to Fluces. Okay, there's Fluces. no snow, she'll go up high Fluces. She's went down this one a couple of times. Down this one here too? Yeah. Okay. So, so double check Fusis over there too, because I think uh, well, more I than Miles, I think Miles. Yeah, I know. We just want to double check everything. So, yeah. Did anybody look for foot tracks on the road? I haven't seen anything really, but like um, people tracks. We're lying. I didn't really notice, but I, I won't lie. I'm not like an expert yeah. tracker or something, you know. Members of the Chafee County Sheriff's Department then gather at one of their vehicles, out of earshot, and they begin discussing the pertinent piece of information that did not match up with what Barry had been telling them. Oh yeah, so we pinged the phone and we said the last activity was at 4 in the morning. Off here? It's off of the Ponce Tower. So there's not any specific hardware. That ping from a cell tower is what had tipped the officers to begin looking in this area. 
It was the last trace of any electronic activity from Suzanne's phone, and it happened around the time that Barry said he was getting up, showering, and heading out to the job. This was still a missing persons case, but the possibility that it was something more couldn't be ignored. Officers then went to the Morphew home with Barry to try to obtain some articles of Suzanne's clothing so tracking dogs could get the scent from them. Which way would that be? This way? No. Let me touch anything down there. These are all hers right here? Yeah. yeah. That night, search teams went out looking for Suzanne, but to no avail. No trace of her could be found, and desperate calls from her friends and family went unanswered. Her distinctive bicycle helmet with a piece of paper inside with her name and phone number on it was found down a ravine along the same road that they had traveled that day. The helmet was about eight-tenths of a mile from where the bicycle had been found, with no signs around that anyone had been near it, as if it may have been tossed from the roadside. Over the next couple of days, Barry would be questioned again and again by investigators from the Sheriff's Office, the Colorado Bureau of Investigations, and special agents from the FBI. Barry and the family even released a video asking anyone in the community for information and setting up an FBI tip line for the case. Barry offered a reward of $100,000 for information, and a family friend added another $100,000 on top of that. Oh, Suzanne, if anyone is out there that can hear this, that has you, please, we'll do whatever it takes to bring you back. We love you. We miss you. Your girls need you. No questions asked. However much they want, I will do whatever it takes to get you back. Honey, I love you. I want you back so bad. Days, then weeks, and then months passed by with no signs of Suzanne being found. The story of an attractive mother who disappeared on a solo Mother's Day bike ride traveled far and well, featured on television news programs locally and nationally, and trending heavily across the Internet. Pundits and then the public began voicing their suspicions and opinions that the husband may have had a hand in the disappearance and that murder was a definite possibility. Information coming from the Chaffee County Sheriff's Office was limited and tightly controlled. In the information void, crime show commentators began leveling charges against Barry for his involvement in the case and casting their anger at the law enforcement agencies there as being everything from unmotivated to complacent or even incompetent. In September of 2020, a search for Suzanne was organized by her brother, David Mormon, that had volunteers fanning out over a number of suspected areas. Suzanne was not found. Even after four days of searching with volunteers who had come from all over the country, the actual investigators, however, were anything but what the media was saying. They were hard at work at the local, state, and federal levels, collecting and collating evidence and tracking down potential witnesses and coming to understand a very difficult relationship between Barry and Suzanne, two people who were much more complicated themselves than anyone understood. Just a few days shy of a year from her disappearance, the Sheriff's Department arrested Barry and charged him with the first-degree murder of his wife, tampering with a deceased human body, tampering with physical evidence, possession of a dangerous weapon, a short rifle with no serial numbers, and an attempt to influence a public servant. He was placed in jail without bond. We're announcing that at 09.15 hours this morning, the Chaffee County Sheriff's Office arrested Suzanne Morphew's husband, Bernie Morphew. He was taken into custody near his home in Poncha Springs. He was alone at the time of his arrest and he was arrested without incident. Today marks the culmination of thousands of hours in this comprehensive investigative effort to locate the mother of two who went missing May 10th of 2020. We've executed more than 135 search warrants across Colorado. We've interviewed more than 400 individuals in multiple states. Our team has also investigated more than 1,400 tips generated from within and outside of law enforcement. 
Today is not the day for celebration, nor does it mark the end of this investigation. Rather, it's the next step in this very difficult yet very important journey as we seek justice for Suzanne and her family. I know how deeply this case has impacted our community over the past 12 months. Through multiple conversations I've had with our citizens across the county, one message is clear from everyone, and that's that they wanted answers and they wanted justice for Suzanne. Sheriff John Speezy then spoke on the difficulty of working this case with so much public attention and scrutiny. It got us where we are today, and based on other information we gathered, we acted on it. I mean, today became the day, but it's been a culmination of everything we've gained over the past year. And I know for everybody here, you say, well, that's hard to understand that because we haven't said so much about the investigation. That's what's so important about this investigation that got us here today is the, the amount of, of everything that's gone into this and what's brought us here and the ability to, to remain silent and do the very best we can to put the best case forward. All of that led us to where we are today. The sheriff then explains their opinion of Suzanne's status based on the evidence they found. We believe that she's not alive. We've filed first degree murder charges or we're in the process of filing first degree murder charges. So our belief is Suzanne is still is not alive at this time. Media representatives later successfully petitioned to make the arrest warrant affidavit public. The redacted material shows just how thorough and in-depth the work they had done had been. In all, the document came to 131 densely packed pages of information, including interview transcripts, phone records, photographs, and an immense amount of electronic data collected from the personal lives of Barry and Suzanne. The story it tells is one of a marriage being held together for their children's sake, immense distrust, betrayal, affairs, financial squabbles, and finally, violence. Did you know that data brokers are making fortunes, selling your private information to spammers, scammers, and anybody with a buck? Where you live, where you work, who you know, and you need to be protected. That's why we're excited to tell you about our sponsor, Aura. Aura can identify data brokers exposing your information and submit opt-out requests on your behalf. They're legally required to remove your information if you ask, but you have to ask. Right now, you can try Aura for free for two weeks using the link below. Aura works behind the scenes, protecting you and your family from online threats. The folks at Aura have made it easy to download and set up, and it is a comprehensive suite of protection in one simple application. There's no need for dozens of programs to protect yourself. Aura can do it all in one package at an affordable price. They can even help you with credit monitoring and watching over your home title, all part of the same service. I've used it for years, and I suggest you do too. Please take time to look into Aura and protect yourself. Don't be caught by things lurking in the shadows. Barry, Suzanne, and their daughters moved to their home in Chafee County, Colorado, two years before the incident. Prior to that, they had spent their lives living in Indiana, where they had gone to high school together. Even before selling their home in Indiana, they put down just over $1.5 million in cash for the purchase of their home and land on Puma Path. While they had no obvious connections to the area, Barry was an avid hunter and outdoorsman, and the climate seemed good for Suzanne's health as well. The couple would carry a mortgage on both properties until the one back in Indiana would sell. This would be a source of pressure on the couple that sometimes resulted in arguments. When asked about the relationship between the two, Barry had initially told investigators that everything was fine between them, nothing but the normal difficulties of being married. Investigators soon, however, were able to obtain chat transcripts, text messages, recordings, photos, and other information that painted a much different picture. Even though they did not have Suzanne's phone, they were able to provide search warrants to the organizations behind apps and websites such as Facebook, LinkedIn, and WhatsApp to at least piece together her side of the story. Suzanne had been confiding in her friends that she and Barry had been on the rocks for quite some time. She described a situation of distrust, emotional abuse, and controlling ways from her husband, along with extreme jealousy. Money was often a source of their arguments, and apparently Suzanne had loaned her husband a sizable amount of money at some point prior to her disappearance. 
As late as March 25, 2020, she was discussing it with a friend and how arguments were continuing. She even told her friend, Ugh, he came home when the girls are gone. He won't speak of divorce, begging for another chance. I'm so torn, but in my heart, I know who he is. Investigators found a few examples of arguments on Barry's phone, though. He told them that he regularly deleted argument chats because he didn't want either of his daughters stumbling across them. One text, however, had been inadvertently saved by Barry as a photo. Dated May 6th of 2020, it read, I'm done. I could care less what you're up to and have been for years. We just need to figure this out civilly. While Suzanne's chat messages tell a story of Barry's jealousy, another set of messages from her records led investigators to learn that Barry's jealousy and suspicions were probably warranted. Suzanne had been having an affair, and it had been going on for a couple of years, and it was very serious. Investigators found numerous chats, texts, and photos with someone only listed as Jeff in Suzanne's online accounts. Investigators had a very important lead here, but the question remained, who was Jeff? Her Facebook friends list had numerous Jeffs, and there were many other contacts with the same name in other areas of her life. The key to this new person of interest was found in another piece of electronics that Suzanne owned, a spy pen she had been using to record conversations. Suzanne had used the pen numerous times to record conversations with people and to spy on her husband. Among the recordings were some very revealing conversations with Jeff. They still didn't have a last name, but they now knew the sound of his voice. A special agent of the FBI then went down the full list of all of the Jeffs she knew, calling each one in turn, and as they answered the phone, he checked to see if the voice matched. Finally, it did. The man was Jeff Libler. When investigators reached him by phone, he quickly admitted that he had been having an affair with her. He said that he had dropped from the scene when he heard of her disappearance because he didn't want the news of their affair to come out, in turn devastating her daughters or possibly costing him his job. Jeff was married and had six children of his own. Jeff had a very long history with Suzanne and Barry. All three went to the same high school together, where Barry was a star baseball player and Jeff played golf. Barry and Suzanne were dating then, but one evening at a party Barry wasn't able to attend, Jeff and Suzanne hooked up. Later on, Barry found out and accosted Jeff on the golf course where he worked, but Jeff was able to talk his way out of the potentially violent confrontation. Barry and Suzanne would later go on to marry, and Jeff would find his own life. He would admit, though, that he had continued to carry a torch for Suzanne over those intervening decades. Then, one day on social media in 2018, he received a quick note from her saying, Howdy, stranger. What developed was, at first, chats, then calls. Then Jeff began to get cold feet and told investigators that he tried to distance himself from her by deleting all of his social media accounts, and he stopped taking calls from her. It worked until December of 2018, when he said that she contacted him through his work-mandated LinkedIn page. In short order, a long-distance relationship was back on. The two began arranging meetups, traveling to New Orleans, Indianapolis, Dallas, Michigan, and then Florida on two occasions. Jeff explained that on the first trip, the two just met and talked. By the second, and from then on, though, the two were making the most of their getaways, going out to eat, staying together, having relations before returning to their homes and families. Jeff said she had proclaimed her love to him in 2018 and felt as if they were soulmates. She would not leave her marriage until her daughters were both in college, though. At least that's what she told him. Jeff told investigators he didn't think Barry knew about the affair, and he said he never went to meet her in Colorado because Barry had so much surveillance equipment on the house. Investigators would receive consent from Jeff to obtain a DNA sample from him, along with his phone records and the logins to all of his social media accounts. The telephone records alone told how tawdry their affair may have been. 
From October of 2018 until December of 2019, there were 738 calls between the two. That's roughly 50 a month. When Suzanne and Barry had taken a trip to the Cayman Islands on January 14th through the 18th of 2019, Jeff and Suzanne had called each other 74 times alone. Most telling may be that on Saturday, May the 9th, the day before Suzanne was reported missing, she and Jeff had had 59 communications together, beginning with her sending a text of, Guess who's alone again? at 11.42 a.m. along with a photo. Her last message was, On WA at 2.11 p.m. to let him know to engage with her using WhatsApp and the video function therein. Investigators consider that last photo sent by Suzanne of her proof-of-life photo, establishing that at that time she was still alive. There was no proof from then on that she was still among the living. Her phone would give a ping to a nearby cell tower the next morning at 4.10 a.m. and again at 4.15 a.m. Piecing together what happened next on Saturday, investigators have nothing from Suzanne's phone, but Barry's return home was registered by his phone and the telematics from his Ford F-350 truck, a top-end model specifically capable of handling large loads and towing things like uh, bobcats and large equipment. It also had a distinctive muffler whose sounds were very familiar to the people who lived in the neighborhood. Barry said that he had been home earlier and had a bowl of vegetable soup with his wife for lunch before heading out to look at a job site and run some errands. He returned home and then parked the truck and left his driver's side door open. Then, strangely, Barry's phone showed that he began moving quickly around the house, zigzagging back and forth across his property for almost 30 seconds. FBI Special Agent Jonathan Grusing asked Barry what was the reason for him running around like that when he got home. Were you looking for her? He asked pointedly during the interview. Barry responded by saying, I shoot chipmunks. He went on to explain that he was chasing one at that time, and he had shot about 85 of them since moving there. Since moving in, he said, a chipmunk had gotten into their heating system and caused some very expensive damage, so he tried to keep them away from his house. When asked if he had used a 22 to shoot the chipmunk, Barry said that he had. As an avid hunter, it seems strange that you would be shooting any kind of a firearm that close to a home while moving about randomly with his wife there, even if it was a small caliber weapon. While a 22 long rifle round had been found in the floor of the couple's bedroom, a 22 caliber rifle was not one of the weapons found lying open in the house when it had been searched. Barry would later turn the rifle over to Special Agent Grusing, an older gun. It had been modified with an illegally short barrel, and the stock had been cut down to a pistol-style grip, and it had a scope mounted on it. It was certainly sufficient for killing chipmunks. The behavior was odd, and it was also something he never mentioned to investigators when describing the events of the day before Suzanne's disappearance. This would be just one of many inconsistencies or inaccuracies that would be on Barry's side of the tale of that fateful Mother's Day weekend. Barry's story of the weekend remained that of a quiet night at home, leaving her early to head to a job in Denver and pretty much nothing else until he heard that she was missing the next day. Barry and Suzanne wanted to get the house ready for their daughter's return on Sunday, and she said she planned on going for a mountain bike ride. Except things didn't add up when compared to what certain pieces of evidence were showing. First, Suzanne's phone seemed to go dead Saturday afternoon, with the exception of the two early morning pings in the vicinity of their home. Barry's own phone would go into airplane mode that evening as well. Barry told the investigators that at dinner, he and Suzanne had shared a steak. When asked if they used separate plates, Barry said they had. Only one plate, however, was found in the dishwasher. As for going to sleep sometime between 8 and 9 p.m. after a bout of lovemaking, Barry's truck telematics showed that at 9 p.m. it was backed up to the garage and then after a short while was driven 95 feet down the driveway. Curiously, there is a flurry of activity in the parking lights between 3.26 a.m. and 3.49 a.m., 
with nothing again until 8.10, when coordinates show that it was in the Denver suburb of Broomfield, Colorado. Perhaps Barry had been mistaken about what time they turned in for the night, but could he have forgotten about going out to the truck at 3 o'clock in the morning? The trip to Denver would prove problematic as well, as the trip from his home to the city was curiously about 14 miles longer than the trip coming home. In both cases, Barry claims to have taken the exact same route. While curvy mountain roads could conceivably make one leg of the journey a bit longer than the return one, a greater than 10% difference in mileage is nearly impossible without a side trip happening along the way. Barry's story of checking into the hotel, taking a shower, and then heading out to the job site becomes problematic as well. Even though Barry had not intended to stay the night, he is seen carrying boots and a heavy shirt or jacket while wearing a backpack. And why would he need a shower after having had one at 4.30 that morning? Leaving to head to the work site, he had switched into a lighter short-sleeve shirt and had ditched the backpack. He still has his bags at 9.06 as he heads out of the building. Three minutes later, he's back at the elevator, though, this time without the bags. Perhaps he took them to his car. A couple of hours later, Barry was back at the hotel in yet another different shirt. Barry's story, though, was that he didn't come back to the hotel until much later that day. Further investigations turned up that Barry had stopped at five other locations in town and thrown bags away in their dumpsters before returning to the hotel. When confronted with the information, Barry admitted that as a contractor, he would often take trash from the job site and dump it in dumpsters around town to avoid paying the disposal fees. It was probably a misdemeanor and definitely unethical, but if that was what he was doing, it was far from as serious as disposing of evidence they were alleging that he may have been doing. That being said, investigators found that four of the stops to drop off trash actually happened before he went to the job site. Now, there is no way of knowing what was disposed of at any of the stops, but it had to have been stuff he already had in the truck. As Barry headed back to Chafee County to check on his missing wife, Morgan Gentile and Jeff Puckett showed up. The key Barry provided to Jeff for the room didn't work, so Morgan came to help him get in. Both described the room as having an overwhelming smell of chlorine inside, and there were numerous towels scattered about. Other than that, the room was devoid of any sign that Barry had been there, other than a single piece of mail. It was a letter about property tax, which had been placed in a trash can. The letter was addressed to Barry. Puckett would later tell investigators that it looked like an alibi, having been set there to prove that Barry had been in the place. While Barry didn't later explain the paper in the trash can, he did tell investigators that he had smelled the heavy amount of chlorine in the room. He told them that it must have come from the hotel's pools, or perhaps it had been part of the hotel's cleaning regimen since it was going on during the pandemic. Hotel management would later tell local news agencies that the hotel's pool had been closed throughout the pandemic and that their cleaning products were peroxide-based, not chlorine-based. The question remained, what had happened in that room? Suzanne's brother, David Mormon, would tell news outlets later that one of the deputies who had entered the Morphew house with Barry on the night of the disappearance also remarked that there was a very strong smell of chlorine within the house. The daughter's bedroom did have the bed stripped down to the mattress, part of getting ready for her to return, according to Barry's story. The sheets had been washed and were found in the dryer. Perhaps bleach had been used on them, and some may have spilled by accident in the process. Investigators found something in that dryer, along with the sheets, that seemed extremely out of place. The cover for a tranquilizer dart. Just the cover, but there would be other tranquilizer darts found in the family gun safe in the garage. One box open and missing one of the darts. Barry was not a veterinarian, he was not an animal control officer, and he didn't work for a zoo, so why would he even have one? He could legally own such a weapon as long as it used mechanical means or compressed air to fire the darts. But still, why, when he had a good selection of firearms for hunting already? 
The tranquilizer chemicals on hand at the Morphew garage, though, were strong enough to be used on large four-legged animals. Investigators had to ask. Under questioning, Barry admitted upon moving into the home that he had seen many deer with large racks of antlers on and around the property. Admitting that it was illegal, he said he would use the tranquilizer gun to take down a buck, then remove its antlers and allow it to get back on its feet and return to the wilderness. He would then sell the antlers. Antlers usually sell for between $8 and $16 on the open market, and some can fetch up to hundreds of dollars. If he had taken them early, before the rutting season had really begun, when the antlers still had the developmental velvet on them, the velvet itself would sell for between $100 and $125 per kilo thanks to it being used in traditional Chinese medicine and healing supplements. There was certainly a financial incentive to have this, but it was a relatively small one. An old business partner of Barry's from back in Indiana, however, told FBI investigators that he and Barry used to raise deer for use in fenced hunting areas. Hunters who wanted to be sure of getting a large set of trophy antlers could purchase one from them, have it taken to a field, and then released to be hunted in an escape-proof area. Tranquilizer guns were used to sedate the deer and then load them into a horse trailer for transport to those fields. While Barry had left that sideline business behind him with his move to Colorado, it was reasonable to assume that he bought the tranquilizer gun and ammo along with him. Investigators began to put together a scenario, and to follow up on their hunch, they contacted veterinary pharmacists and experts in handling wildlife to find out about the chemicals that Barry had on hand. The consensus was that if a human was hit with one of those tranquilizer darts, the effect would be very dramatic. First, the darts are meant to pierce thick and hairy hides. Against the human skin, they would penetrate deeply and hurt. The drugs within would take somewhere between 6 and 20 seconds to kick in fully, knocking the person out. Unless crippled by the shot, the person would probably immediately begin running, then they would stagger and then fall down. Suddenly, the zigzag pattern of Barry's chipmunk hunt took on the possibility of something much more sinister happening. Had he shot Suzanne with the tranquilizer gun while she was soaking in the sun in the backyard? Had the erratic movements been him chasing her staggering body around the house and through the breezeway before she fell? The security cameras at the property had long been out of service. There is no footage of such a thing happening, just as there is no footage of Suzanne riding her bike away from the home the next day. There's just an incredible gap in what had happened between Barry getting home and him leaving the next morning. Even with the tranquilizer gun scenario and what could have followed, the question remained, where was the body? It is a question that no one has the answer to, or at least one they will admit. There is nothing but speculation at this point. One thing does stand out, however. It goes back to Suzanne's spy pen, or what it had recorded. Among all the recordings on the spy pen, there was an instance where Suzanne had apparently hid the device in Barry's truck and recorded him over the course of a five-hour drive. In among the regular work phone calls, Barry could be seen listening to true crime podcasts, particularly the television show Forensic Files, one that featured the story of a young woman who had been killed in one location and their bicycle had been left in the road as faked evidence at a different spot to lead investigators astray. It may just have been happenstance that he had been recorded listening to that particular episode, but it would not be hard to at least consider the possibility that there might be a connection. Investigators and the local district attorney's office have long said they felt Suzanne's body is out there somewhere in the wilds of Chafee County, buried under the snow that lingers well into the warmest months of the year. Since the disappearance, though, Colorado and the surrounding states saw a massive shrinkage in their high mountain snowfields due to the warmer weather and a winter drought. If there was any chance of a body being found, the rapidly receding snows that held until October of 2022 would have revealed her. They didn't, and record snowfalls over the winter of 2023 may have reset many of those snowfields or even expanded them. Searches have also been done in the area around the Morphew home, 
along all of the area mountain biking trails and even at a nearby site where a foundation for a new home had just been poured, all to no avail. As tips and leads continued to pour in, the remaining Morphews went about their lives as best they could. Over the next couple of months, Barry would petition the state of Indiana for guardianship of Suzanne, a standard practice in the case of missing persons. This gave him the ability to sign the closing papers and sell the couple's home on Puma Path for just over $1.6 million. He would also sell Suzanne's Range Rover to an out-of-state couple. Some have pointed out that this looks suspicious, but it is more likely that just under the weight of two heavy mortgages, the loss of his wife and reduced work, Barry felt the need to sell quickly before suffering a complete financial collapse. In November of 2020, however, Barry would commit a verifiable crime, one that he would plead guilty to. He sent in Suzanne's mail-in ballot for the presidential election. While he did not sign her name on the envelope, he did sign his name as a witness, and inside the ballot had been marked. When asked why he sent in a ballot for Suzanne, Barry told them, I wanted Trump to win. I just thought, give him another vote. I know all these other guys are cheating. Suzanne was going to vote for Trump anyway. Barry also mailed in his own ballot at the same time. After that incident, everything went quiet for months as investigators followed leads and the days passed with no sign of Suzanne turning up alive or dead. On May 5th, 2021, just five days short of a year from the date of disappearance, members of the Chafee County Sheriff's Office served a warrant for the arrest of Barry Morphew. He was brought in and held before eventually bonding out. Investigators had presented a 131-page affidavit outlining their investigation, the evidence that was found, interviews, and their conclusions to the local district attorney, getting her approval to set up the case. Barry would be charged with murder in the first degree, tampering with evidence, a Class 6 felony, and attempting to influence a public servant, as well as for possession of an illegally modified rifle that he had turned over to the FBI. Months passed as prosecutors and defense attorneys prepared their cases, even going through a change of venue after the defense argued that Barry could not expect to get a fair trial in Chaffee County, considering the publicity the case had created. Along the way, though, either through poor judgment or an attempt to make a stronger case, the district attorney's office stumbled and jeopardized their entire case. Fremont County District Court Judge Ramsey Lama ended up granting the defense an 11-page petition to dismiss the charges against Barry Morphew due to prosecutors missing deadlines for information about their expert witnesses and, most importantly, for not providing the defense with some very specific information they felt could help prove their client innocent. The information dealt with the finding of DNA samples in Suzanne's car of a man which did not match that of Barry or Jeff Libler, the man that she had had an affair with. The DNA did, however, provide a partial match with DNA from an unknown man who was sought in connection with sexual assaults in Chicago as well as Phoenix, Arizona. Having such evidence could have allowed the defense an opportunity to make the case that another man had either abducted or assaulted her. The judge at first penalized the prosecution team by not allowing them to use 12 of their 16 witnesses in the trial, which was scheduled to begin in just a week. A full motion to dismiss the case was eventually granted, and Barry was set free. The district attorney's office, though, vowed to keep investigating the case and expects to resume the charges when and if Suzanne's body is found. The dismissal would allow them to file the same charges against Barry if more evidence comes about since he would not fall under the double jeopardy rules. Barry and his two daughters appeared in an exclusive interview with ABC News after the charges were dropped. We feel like we can finally take our first steps in healing, which is a blessing. And yeah, we, kn we just know our dad better than anyone else. And we know he was not involved in our mom's disappearance. We want to heal. We feel like we haven't been able to heal these past two years. I just love my girls and I love my wife. And I just want her to be found. 
Finally, on May 2, 2023, Barry filed a lawsuit against the Chafee County District Attorney's Office, the Sheriff's Office, the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, and the investigators from the FBI for $15 million. He went on ABC Television's Good Morning America, along with both of his daughters, to explain his position. Both daughters have supported him and have maintained his innocence throughout the investigation. I know that 15 million is a huge number, but I don't think that, in my mind, that covers any of the damage that's happened to Barry and the girls. I know he's innocent, and if they would just look for Suzanne outside of where they hypothesize Barry could have possibly buried her remains, they could find her. You never had a shred of doubt once you heard the evidence from law enforcement against your dad. I've never had a shred of doubt. Not one. They're, they've got tunnel vision, and they looked at one person, and they've got too much pride to say they're wrong and look somewhere else. Barry would continue on to tell the interviewer that it was possible that he could be charged again, but he couldn't live in fear of it because he knew he was innocent the first time and that he would be found innocent in the future. In the end, investigators and prosecutors have made a lengthy and in-depth case against Barry Morphew for the disappearance of his wife. However, beyond the fact that her body as of yet has not been found, there are many alternate explanations for the questionable events uncovered by the investigation, and most had to be considered at least plausible when trying to establish guilt beyond the shadow of a doubt. Did Barry kill Suzanne Morphew and somehow dispose of her body? Was she abducted while taking a mountain bike ride as it first appeared? Could she have just up and left, dropping everything in her life and inexplicably walking away from it on a lonely Mother's Day morning? Perhaps time will tell, and the case may grow completely cold and fade from the memories of those who are not directly connected to it. Thank you for taking this journey with us as we looked into this unsolved case. As we said before, we present this not in an attempt to cast blame, but to look at the evidence provided, the real people involved, and hopefully, maybe, stir up some new information. If you have any information about Suzanne Morphew's disappearance, please contact the Chafee County Sheriff's Office at 719 539 2596. If you found this case compelling, don't forget to like the video, comment down below your take on it, and please subscribe to the channel. Also, hit the notification bell in order to stay up to date each time we reveal a new shocking case. Until next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled. You never know what's lurking in the shadows.